Okay, um, good evening everybody and uh, thanks very much for coming along to the talk. Um, before we start, I just want to pass around a sheet here. Uh, in particular, could I ask all the sports uh, students to sign, um, as this is a requirement, I think, for their course. Also, if there's any members of the IEI or the IEEE, um, I think there's a registration process for gathering uh, points or whatever. So anyone who feels necessary, please feel free to sign this. Okay. So, uh, uh, as I said, thank you all very much for coming along today. Um, I, put, I put together a, a talk here. Hopefully, it's not going to last more than, more than an hour. Um, it's essentially a, a review of uh, how technology is being applied in um, soccer and Gaelic primarily. Uh, and uh, perhaps 50%, maybe 60% of the talk will focus on the whole area of score detection. Uh, and uh, how's, it, how's it currently been looked at in, in GA and in uh, in soccer? Um, I guess I just wanted to start off with uh, a video clip, probably the oldest clip. I um, hope there's no English, um, Germans in the place. But uh, this is uh, those of us who are almost old enough to remember it's the 1966 World Cup. Oh, there we go. As usual, something fails. Um, Jeff Hurst scoring. I think it was three, that was the third goal that England got and essentially put them ahead in the extra time, uh, if I recall correctly. I might be wrong there. Um, so um, the whole issue of score detection obviously has been around. The English media kind of wheel, wheel that particular item out um, every time there's a, a decision uh, or there's a questionable decision in soccer. Um, so um, I suppose... Good idea to explain why, why I'm talking. Um, uh, firstly, I'm a lecturer in uh, the electronic engineering department. I've been here for, uh, for 15 years. Um, my whole area is in, in, in uh, communications and in signal processing. Now, signal processing is how you apply uh, computer programs, computer systems to analyze information that's uh, any type of information that exists in the real world, whether it's video or whether it's speech or whether it's any other type of quantity you can measure. Um, in terms of my sporting quote-unquote credentials, um, a long-suffering fan of Galway football team, uh, not so long-suffering fan of Man United, and a 20-year veteran of the worst uh, soccer in Ireland, junior soccer in Galway. Um, so I suppose first, the first part of this talk is a history lesson. It's why I was asked to give this talk. As I've said to a number of people, this is like something uh, I shouldn't have done 20 years ago and it's going to follow me around for the rest of my life and pop its head up every now and again and drag me back into it. Um, about, 15, 20 years, about 15 years ago, the GA and Furberch, uh, Furberch was the precursor to Enterprise Ireland at the time, they gave us a bucket load of money to do some research. Um, it was a a co-funded project between the two of them uh, that wanted to look at technologies, advanced technologies, and how, how they could be applied to a couple of different aspects, specifically of hurling. Um, the Hurling Development Board and Pat Daly, who was the head of the Hurling Development Board at the time, um, wanted to look at two things. First thing they wanted to look at was the whole area of slitters and standardizing the manufacture of slitters, because there was massive variability in the quality of the slitters at the time. And my colleague in mechanical engineering, Crawford Brodick, and uh, a Clare County hurler called Lorcan Hassett were involved in that side of the project. Our side of the project was to look at technologies that could be looked at, uh, particularly point detection for hurling. Uh, because at the time, there was a number of, uh, of games where there had been questionable decisions made from points. So I was kind of the main uh, PI at the time uh, over, overseeing the project. And I had a master student, Martino Canela, who was... Uh, 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 who played with uh, Karua, won a county, was on the county um, winning team in, during one of the years involved. We, we worked on that project, and the aim of it was to look first at what technologies might be used and to build some sort of pr proof of concept uh, demonstration system. Um, we built that at the end, okay, and it essentially was a combination of uh, video cameras, two video cameras, and a uh, inside a uh, computer at the time, and uh, from what I recall, the computers at the time run at the massive speed of probably about 50 megahertz or something like that. Uh, we had this very expensive uh, specialist computer board, uh, which I've managed to route out a photograph from I don't know where. Um, it essentially had four microprocessors, each of, each of which 
the microprocessors themselves cost in the region of £1,000 at the time. And uh, essentially those microprocessors were analysing the video stream coming from the two digital cameras. Um, just to give you a kind of an idea of the budget we were looking at, the, the hardware loan that's encompassed there cost us £10,000 at the time, uh, which was 1996 or so. Uh, the whole budget for our side of the project was 25000 and we had to pay Marchin's uh, fees and stipend and a few other bits and pieces, uh, all of which probably added up to 20000 So we kind of overran the budget by about five grand, which I don't know, we kind of whipped out of some other budget at the time. Um, what came out of it, apart from this demonstration, project, uh, demonstration model, was this uh, academic paper, which I'm sure absolutely nobody here has, has ever seen. Um, the paper outlined uh, how our system worked, um, uh, did a technical analysis of the, uh, the system in terms of uh, the operation of the various microprocessor chips and what tasks they did. Um, it, it was quite a sophisticated, quite a sophisticated uh, uh, system overall in terms of how complex it was to actually put together. Um, but what was interesting about it, particularly in the context of what I'll talk about in a minute, which is kind of state of the art in terms of goal line detection, is that a lot of the stuff we kind of looked at and how, how we based our system um, is key, is kind of the basic building blocks of how many of the proposed systems that are being uh, put forward at the minute operate. So in terms of video analysis, you've got a couple of key steps um, that you have to do um, for any type of score detection approach that uses video. Um, the first and most obvious thing is, is, is that video is a sequence of, of camera stills taken one after another. That's all video is. It isn't any great magic. So in terms of any kind of score detection or ball tracking in, in, in field sport, the first thing you have to do is find, get, get your computer program to actually find where the ball is. Now, there are some very, very simple ways to do it, um, and that's what we basically did at the time, a very, very simple um, scenario. So essentially, we've got three images here. Um, this is a frame, sorry, this is a frame on the, the right-hand side from the live camera. This is basically an average of what the background normally looks like, and by just subtracting, doing a basic subtraction between those two images, you get this, what we'd call a difference or a delta image. Um, quite apparent, you know, no great rocket science to figure out that the main place the two images differ is where the ball is. So that allows you to identify that you don't have to process through the whole image, which could be 20, 30, 100,000 little pixels, uh, each one making up part of the image. You only have to focus in on that small area, okay? And then what you can do is, okay, all you know at that stage is there's something moving there, okay? You have to figure out, uh, is it a ball? And most importantly, if it is a ball, where is the center of the ball? Okay, so you've got a couple of steps there. Firstly, find where there's something moving. Second, determine is it a ball. And uh, thirdly, accurately find the center. And we came up with, looking back on it now, it was a relatively simple, admittedly at the time, it was uh, in terms of getting it done and getting it working in a prototype was a quite a challenging task to do. Um, when we gave our final report to the, uh, the Hurling Development Board in 1999, we essentially demoed the system and we outlined to them two possible deployment methodologies. Um, one of which was what we called, and, uh, at the time, the goalpost eyes. Now, again, I rooted out the original images uh, that I had in a file that obviously went from about four different PCs in three different locations as I moved around the college in the intervening 15 years. This is the original image. Uh, hence the very uh, childlike quality of it all that uh, we used in our presentation to the whole Hurling Development Board. Um, essentially the idea was that uh, for this type of deployment you were looking at a system that could take, attempt to detect points when the ball travelled above the height of the actual goal post. So we would have proposed that you'd have two cameras in each goal post looking directly upwards and they were solely going to cover that type of scenario where the ball was travelling at such a height it went above the goalpost height. Um, the idea would be that the ball would uh, travel, here's the ball travelling across the uh, path, here it is in plan view, okay, so it has travelled, we can see it's been captured during two frames only, it went through the camera image. Now here we've got a little schematic of what the camera image sees and basically during the two frames where we captured the ball we can see that it travelled from this point here to this point here. Now the green line 
uh, sorry, the cross line represents the centre of the goalpost and the green line represents the valid point scoring area. So we can see for that case, while it came pretty close to travelling directly over the top of the, uh, of the centre of the post, it hasn't passed through the actual point scoring region. So that was the original concept that we uh, deployed and we actually had the working prototype uh, that operated uh, showing that in operation. The second scenario uh, which we proposed was again what we call the point watcher and again we outlined this as a proof of concept uh, uh, to them that this could be a simple extension of what we'd already done and it was a separate type of model where you'd have one camera looking along the length of the goal line <coughs> and the other camera positioned behind the goal looking directly outwards. So the camera that was looking along the length of the goal line its, its picture would look something like this. Everything obviously to the left hand side would be the in-play region. Everything to the right-hand side would be at the out-of-play region. The camera behind the goal would look at the pink region, uh, uh, the shot from behind the goal, and everything in the pink region would essentially be what was between the goal posts and the white regions or what are outside. So again, if you had a scenario where a ball would come passing through, uh, it would be captured in a number of different video frames. There's the first one. Second video frame is a move towards the goal. Third video frame passes over the goal uh, crossbar and the fourth one comes along here. Okay, so we can see it has kind of moved through the two images on the bottom. Okay, what's most important though is that in this scenario, because you're synchronizing your cameras, if we look at the two frames where the ball went from being in play to being directly out of play, the fact it's gone from being in play to out of play can be distinguished by looking at the image here on the goal line camera. Okay, in one case in frame number two, it was in the greener area in frame three in the red area. And we can look at what happened during the transition between those two frames because they're synchronized on two cameras. We can see, well, when the ball was going from in-play to outer play did it stay within the bounds of the pink, the scoring region? And we can see in this case it did. Okay, so that was the second deployment mode we outlined to them at the time. And that's a, that type of positioning of two cameras is a special, uh, a special configuration of what we call stereo vision. Okay, and I'll talk a little bit more about stereo vision in a minute. So, kind of that's the background. How did we end that project? As I said, it was only a proof of concept, and um, there was limitations, and these were outlined to the uh, GA at the time. Uh, the most obvious limitation was that while we were using cameras that were about two grand each, they were just ordinary cameras. They only produced a video image 25 times a second. Now, when you do the kind of calculation, then you <coughs> kind of take the upper range of what a slitter can travel at, say, 150 kilometers an hour. That means that between two of the frames that make up uh, the video, the ball can have traveled 1.7 meters, okay? And obviously, that's way too much of a movement to be able to accurately track uh, the ball in space, okay? You would have to increase the speed of the camera by a factor of probably 10, 20, 40 to get it up to a frame rate that would be sufficient so that you could localize the position of the ball with much, much greater accuracy, okay? Secondly, the resolution of the camera was pretty rubbish compared to modern cameras. Okay? The actual camera image, if you look at any of those images, whether you realize it or not, it's basically made up of a sequence of uh, dots. Okay? In, in the case of our cameras, there was 480 dots across the top, 320 dots down the side. And that's pretty poor compared to modern, modern cameras. And the issue with that type of resolution is that the further the ball away is from the camera, the smaller it appears and the harder it is to locate it with great accuracy as to where is its centre. So you're going to need cameras that were much, much higher resolution. Uh, thirdly, the algorithms, the mathematical techniques we were actually using, to be blunt, were quite basic and quite simple. And the reason why they were that way was that that was all that was possible, even with 10,000 pounds worth of processing uh, uh, hardware in our computers. And uh, they were full, though they, the computer systems were basically going as fast as they could go. They could go. They were running at about 90, 95% of their capabilities. Uh, there were far more uh, reliable and far more sophisticated mathematical techniques we could have used, but you would have never got them running and working in a prototype. And the most uh, practical of problems is that in our demo, we had a PC with a cable hanging out about three meters long going to each of the two cameras, and that was never going to work in the real system. You need it wired, uh, wireless links. So how do we leave it with the GA? This is what I call the couldn't we just make the goalpost higher uh, slide, because that was what was said to us. Couldn't we just make the goalpost higher? Because I was asked, well, okay, guys, you've done a proof of concept. 
how much now to bring it forward to fit out Grow Park? And I, at the time, said, okay, you put me on the spot, mm, 250 grand, okay? And again, 250 grand sounds absolutely trivial now when we're talking about millions and billions and trillions, but 250,000 pounds in 1998 was a hell of a lot of money, even for the <laughs> GAA. So the answer was, thanks, but no thanks. Uh, and rightly so, in retrospect. The GAA would have taken a massive risk in investing that kind of money to take it forward. Uh, the couldn't we make the goalpost higher was a much simpler solution, which obviously uh, was uh, going to sway, win this way over us. And the fact that our solution was only going to ever find its way into Crow Park at the time was a big blocker for them. They were kind of driving this whole project about something they could deploy down to club level, down to county level. Okay. The GA then revisited the project again in the mid 2000s uh, in terms of uh, uh, they funded another project, uh, I believe, in Cork Institute of Technology, looking at a system that was based on <coughs> radar. But again, that didn't really progress anywhere. Now, I suppose the ar ironic aspect of our project was that just about when we were finishing uh, our project, there were, unbeknownst to us, there was a group over in the UK in a small research company called Re uh, Rogue Manor Research who started a project. Uh, uh, for cricket, uh, trying to track a ball. Uh, by, uh, and about two or three years later, they had a patent, they had a demonstration system, and it was these two guys, Paul Hawkins in particular, and those of you who know Athens will recognise that Hawk, as in Hawkeye, that this was the <coughs> Hawkeye system. And the interesting thing was that the methodology they use is based on stereo vision, exactly what we were proposing to use for one of our deployment methodologies. Okay, so that's history. Uh, back up to the current day, why is uh, goal line technology uh, so much of interest? To be honest, in GEA, there's probably more controversial decisions. Uh, of course, the issue is that in soccer, it's more ho high profile. You have a bad decision, and it's in the media, left, right, and centre across the world. Okay, my own personal favourite, being a Man United fan, is when Roy Carroll didn't drag the ball about two metres behind the goal line back out again in 2005. Uh, we have, of course, poor old Frank, in the World Cup in uh, 2010, when of course England would have gone on to win had it, had it been given. <laughs> and my own personal favourite, when Chelsea got a goal last year, when Gomez let the ball through his legs, but he did manage to grab it before it crossed across uh, the goal line. Um, that one would have been quite interesting, okay, because effectively, had that not gone in, Chelsea would have only drawn, and this was in the run in <coughs> to the, uh, the Premiership. I think it was just before the Man United game when United finally seized it sealed the title. Um, so had Chelsea only drawn there rather than win, it would have made a, probably a substantial difference. So goal line technology, particularly in the soccer domain, has seen a lot of uh, interest and certainly FIFA has a very turbulent relationship, uh, as they have with most things, but with goal line technology in particular. Um, they first started seriously looking at it in 2005 in the, in the Under-17 World Cup in Peru, uh, where they evaluated one system that I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, the results there was that it was unreliable. Um, and it came up and it came down and in the media. And again, I think primarily by Lampard, the issue with Lampard, it uh, finally came back on the radar again after the World Cup. And as a result, F FIFA are now actively engaged in looking at uh, trying to, to uh, evaluate and come up with a technology they're willing to work with. They have outlined in a white paper uh, the criteria that the system must have. Um, it's quite a short document, surprisingly, and the criteria for uh, successful uh, systems are that it's only going to be used for goals, nothing else, not offside, nothing else, end of story. Must be what they call 100% reliable. Uh, the, what the media think is the key one, which is that uh, when a decision is made, it has to be conveyed to the ref within one second, and uh, only the ref will know, and he'll know by means of either a, visual, uh, a vibration on a uh, a wristwatch or an audio signal in his earpiece. Okay? And of course there's an associated one that any solution that involves tampering the, the ball, uh, the balls that are going to be used have to obviously be conforming to FIFA standard. FIFA have to already approve them or they have to be previously tested by some international independent testing body. So they're the criteria of uh, what FIFA wants at the moment. Um, <coughs> In early 2010, they carried out an initial evaluation with 10 different candidate technologies and basically came back and said none of them worked uh, sufficiently well. Um, but they were willing to give another 12 months and come back and revisit it. Uh, as a result, in late 2011, uh, 
nine candidate technologies were put forward uh, for an initial testing process. Um, there's going to be two phases of that. I'll talk a little bit about, more, more about that in a moment. And the, what's called the International Football Association Board will review the results of that testing in the middle of this year, in 2012, with a view potentially to recommending one of these technologies and writing it into the rule book uh, as, a, as, a, as a suitable technology. Um, so we'll, we'll look at these technologies, but this might sound like a stupid question, but when is it actually a goal? So here's my little schematic of the goal. Um, there's the ground, here's the goal, here's the pitch side. So, so when is it a goal? Um, well, as the rules of the game say, it's when all of the ball is over all of the line. So here's my little schematic with the ball over the line. Okay, that's when it actually just is a goal. Okay, so kind of putting it in somewhat pseudo-engineering terms, uh, what it means is that the centre of the ball has to be at least X centimetres behind the goal line. Okay, that's what it actually means. So the first question is, what's X? Okay. Um, so we go to the uh, rule book of FIFA, uh, because X is the radius of the football, and we already see our first kind of uh, little bit of vagueness. Um, the uh, size of a football is uh, about 65 and a, a half uh, circumference in centimetres, and that means that it's somewhere between 11.9 and, sorry, 10.92 and 11.06 centimetres. So it's not exact, is the first thing. I think this is the first thing people have to realise. This isn't going to be exact, but it's about 11 centimetres. So in other words, when the ball centre is 11 centimetres behind the goal line, it's a goal in the story. So that's what a goal is. Um, what are the candidates? The first thing is, it's top <coughs> secret. Chief Aaron going to tell you who the candidates definitely are. Okay? Some of them have come out and, uh, to the public and admitted who, who they are. The rest of it is a little bit speculation, but uh, Hawkeye is the first one. Um, there's uh, another English company called Goldminder, a, a, a German tech company called Kairos, Swiss timing company called Swiss Timing. Uh, these two guys, uh, ORAD and Sports Vision, um, Tagore, who uh, you, you recognise as a watch maker, and a company, again, that very little is known about called Goldref. So I want to look at some of these because th some of them use quite different technologies and um, worth having a look at uh, trying to understand how they operate. First one is Goldminer. Goldminer is a, a company uh, involving a couple of guys in the UK who uh, basically are football fans and want to, uh, to develop their own technique. One of them is a millionaire, the other is an electrician, and uh, they put together this system. Uh, quite a nice, elegant system, to be quite honest. Um, these are a couple of st stills. They basically have 24 high-definition cameras uh, in a structure that's directly behind the goalpost. So that's the goalpost here in white. Uh, here's some of the cameras on, uh, the, behind the goalpost. Um, here's at the bottom of the goalpost. Same across the top bar. And basically, it's a video-based system. Okay? So um, here's some stills from a, a top-down camera, one of the cameras in the crossbar looking down. And this line here is the simulated goal line. It's a very high-speed camera, high definition, so you get lots of frames per second. The ball isn't going to move that far in each frame, even when it's kicked as, at the speeds it can be kicked at. And you've got very high resolution, so you can very accurately see where the ball is. And what we can see in this sequence is, you know, a typical... They're not one frame after another here. There's frames in between these. But what they're trying to do is identify when the ball is in the image, when does it travel over the goal line. Okay? So it's a nice, simple, elegant. The reason for the 24 cameras is obviously so that if one camera is blocked or another one, hopefully there's another camera there that can see the ball. And all of these systems, when it comes to the computer programs that will analyze compu uh, completely autonomously, that will analyze these images, you know, they're capable of dealing with scenarios where the ball may be significantly blocked by a player's body or um, you know, something else. I don't know what else. Maybe a balloon if you're a Liverpool, if Liverpool are playing. Okay, so there's one interesting sort of problem just to tie it into sort of, sort of some basic optics here. Um, one key thing here is the position of the cameras. Okay, this is the absolute key. The rest of it is not dissimilar from techniques I talked about and what we did, trying to identify where the ball is, trying to uh, find its centre, trying to be sure it is the ball. There's one physical problem that's important, that's the issue of parallax. Parallax, very, very simple concept, okay? You see it every day if you're travelling, driving in a car along the road, you've got telegraph poles, and there's uh, obviously stuff in the distance. The poles appear to move relative to things in the, in, in, in the distance. That's what basically parallax is. 
or put it this way, we need the camera in the right place. Okay? Here we have again just the exact moment a goal happens. Now let's look at what happens if we put the camera in different positions and where is the right place to put it. Okay, if we were to put the camera over the goal, the problem is that we can see there's a parallax issue. The camera is looking down and as far as the edge of the ball appears, it, do, it appears to be behind the goal line, just as we see it over here. So if we put the camera there, we think it's, uh, it's well over the goal line, when in fact it's just a goal. If we put the camera over the 11 centimetre mark, we get a different parallax issue, and we think the ball is still over the goal line. So the right place to put it is directly over the back end of the goal line, and we're looking straight down and we see it. So the placement of the camera is key. And if you recall back to the, the images I had in the placement here, you will see that that's, if you look at the far right one here, that camera is essentially looking along the back end of the goal line, okay, to avoid any issue with parallax. Okay, so that's the goal minder one. Now, before I start talking to Hawkeye, I decide, we decided, when we were setting up the talk, that for a laugh, we'd see if we could put together a demo that more or less operated the same as that goal minder, okay? Bear in mind, this was put together by Shane here in about two days, okay? So it essentially mimics technology that we developed over two years, uh, 15 years ago, and it's rough and ready, but it demonstrates the basic capabilities of how, um, how the, system, uh, how, how the uh, system might work. So hopefully it works, as I said, these things sometimes don't work. All right, so maybe Shane can talk us uh, through it. Um, is your laptop plugged in? Okay, um, so a couple of days ago I was asked by Liam to put together a, um, a demo for today and basically, you've probably seen it on the way in, it's a goal, a uh, little goal made out of tubing uh, with a camera mounted on top, um, which is basically what the solution that he's been talking about before was and what we've done here is very similar to what the algorithm that was mentioned in the first couple of frames, which is where you take um, uh, a reference image of what the, the goal looks like without a ball there, and then you subtract the image from when the ball is there. And so if I run the code here, we will see. Um, so as we can see in this picture here, there is a there are two frames. Uh, this black frame is the difference between the reference image, which is um, a, just a straight top-down picture taken at the start of the, the video that's updated periodically. Um, and the one on the right is the difference frame, which is basically the subtraction of one frame from the other. And if Liam rolls the ball uh, across the goal line, we should see it tracking the ball, and as it goes across the goal line, it flashes up a little goal message. It's, uh, it's, it's not exactly very glamorous, and it's not something that we expect to see uh, used in the Premiership anytime soon, but that's basically how it functions. It's, it's an interesting... Uh, it's a little algorithm that functions exactly the way that um, Liam was talking about before. It detects a circle, it detects a ball using Hoff transforms, if anybody uh, knows what they are. And then it detects where the ball is in relation to the goal line and figures out whether the ball has crossed the line. And it did actually work, thankfully. All right. Okay. So, three days of work and there you go. So it just illustrates, so it just illustrates essentially that um, in terms of the goal minder system, it's not actually that sophisticated. Okay, um, I'll just flick back now to my, my slides. So if we move up uh, and talk about the next uh, uh, approach is Hawkeye. Okay, everyone, um, everyone uh, is uh, kind of has some idea about Hawkeye. It's been around for uh, at this stage 10 years in various sports. It's official in tennis and in cricket. It's, um, uh, I think they're using it at snooker now. Uh, you can't take Hawkeye and tell you they can't say anything about soccer or Gaelic because... Uh, that may or may not be doing anything about it. Okay? But uh, essentially it's based on deploying six cameras uh, looking at the scoring area, whether that's just the goal in, 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 in soccer or whether it's the point and goal region in Gaelic. Uh, we're operating at very high speeds. It appears about 500 frames a second uh, in some cases. Essentially, each one of those cameras has been analysed. So every 500 times a second, an image is coming through that's been processed by a computer at each camera. It each camera is essentially doing what we've just done, which is trying to pick out the ball and where it is in it. And the information from those six computers then is fed into another computer that uh, amalgamates all the information about where the ball was detected, if it was detected in each of the six cameras. And from that, it can figure out, well, where is the ball in the real world in terms of relative to the goal post? Has it moved through the valid scoring area? 
Okay, so that's the basic idea of, of Hawkeye. Uh, they claim it'll work um, at a very good look, uh, ability to localize where the ball is down to a couple of millimeters, even if the ball is uh, up to uh, three quarters occluded by bodies or hurleys or whatever. Okay, uh, how does it work? Very, very briefly, a crash course. Firstly, uh, well, what is a camera? A camera. Uh, basically a simple idea of what a camera is is given by this kind of image at the top where we have a tree uh, a ray of light comes from the top of the tree uh, it goes through the lens which is uh, represented uh, here onto the uh, part of the camera where the picture is taken okay so the height of the tree gets uh, converted into uh, an image that's probably uh, very very small okay now what that means, uh, an easier way of analysing it is rather than looking at it as a ray of light that comes through the camera and then goes further on past the, uh, past the lens into uh, sort of the electronics part of the, of the, uh, of the uh, camera, is you kind of view it as, well, the image of the tree is placed in front, is, is mathematically you can think of it as being in front of the uh, camera. Okay, so here's this real building, there's the actual camera. Mathematically you can think of... Uh, that you've got this square through which all the rays of light pass through. And, uh, you know, there's a relationship there between where, uh, uh, where points are in the real world and where they appear in the image, which is the, uh, which is the, the camera's uh, view of the real world. So basically every point that exists along, let's say, this line here, okay, appears as a dot, a single dot, okay, <coughs> on the camera image. Okay, you then wheel in this term stereo vision, which uh, I mentioned before. Now, stereo vision means that you've got two cameras at least, okay? All you need is two, two cameras looking at the same thing, okay? And as I said, those two cameras are looking at the same scene, and essentially, if you have two cameras, and you're looking at that point up there in the distance, um, you know where the representation of it is in this image, and you know where it is in the image taken by the other camera. And by some mathematical jiggery pokery, if you know a few other bits and pieces about the cameras and where they are and the characteristics of the cameras, what are called the intrinsic and extrinsic parameters of the cameras, and physically where they are, literally very accurately, where are they relative to one another, you can actually, by taking where the two images, the two points, P1, is in the camera image uh, for the first camera and the other P2 uh, is in the camera image for the second one, you can actually, by mathematics, figure out where P is in the real world relative to the actual physical position of the cameras. Okay? Might be better explained by this example, uh, which is actually taken from real Hawkeye images. Uh, so here's the two cameras looking at the same scene, believe it or not. Uh, you would think from the camera two image at the top that the ball is actually not in the goal, but you can clearly see it is behind the goal line in, in, in this one. So let's look at how Hawkeye would actually process this and figure out that it was in the, in, it's actually valid. First thing is, uh, you've got this scaling, you know, you've, you've got some sort of representation of where every element of this, these pictures are. So we've got an X and a Y representation. Okay, so we can figure out where is the center of the ball. Uh, there it is. Okay, it's at this point, 200 across, 350 down. Okay, and in the other camera, we can represent where the ball is. Uh, there it is. It's at 420 across in that picture, 175 down. Okay, we can then plug it into our mathematics that I'm not going into, okay, which would take into account where the two cameras are, what types of cameras they are, etc., etc., and it would come out and give us, uh, this is where the ball is in the real world. It's half a metre behind the goal line, it's 35.3 metres from the left sideline, and it's 0.4 of a metre off the ground. So what Hawkeye then has to decide is, is it a goal? Well, it's behind the goal line, so it may be a goal. Okay, it's in the middle of the pitch. All right, so the last question is, is it under the crossbar? And of course it is, it's only 0.4 meters off the ground. So it is a goal. So essentially that's how Hawkeye works, okay, in very, very um, high level view. Okay, here's some good, uh, as you know, uh, GA have been looking at Hawkeye, uh, some nice images that GA shared me in preparing this talk uh, from a uh, hurling game between Dublin and, and uh, Kilkenny in April. Okay, so in this case there was one incident where the Dublin keeper that you may be able to uh, pick out there. He uh, dragged the ball from up above the crossbar. Okay, there he is jumping up. He dragged it from behind, uh, essentially dragged it from behind the goal line. Okay, the umpires actually called the decision. But the important thing is, in terms of the GA, is that um, Hawkeye actually did detect it as a point. Okay, 
Um, the other interesting thing about it is that that particular game was on at half five uh, in April. It was under floodlights. So that's why the quality looks kind of dim. It was actually under floodlights. So it was actually quite a challenging, uh, quite a challenging game in which to uh, do the evaluation. Okay? So it is pretty good. It is very accurate. It's very sophisticated. Okay? The problem with Hawkeye is it's very expensive. Um, you have to have a team of Hawkeye engineers on site for every game. Okay? A number of them do a very accurate surveying of the actual uh, stadium and positions in the stadium because you need to know that information to actually build the mathematics of how it operates. You need guys on site uh, you, uh, to do that. You need Hawkeye engineers on site to actually run the system. So it's very, very expensive um, as a solution. Okay, so that's Hawkeye. Uh, the third one I'll talk about is this Kairos uh, goal line technology. And it's interesting because it's an in-ball technology, okay, which is quite interesting. Okay, sometimes it's called the Spodnik ball because it looks, some say, that this thing in the middle looks a bit like Spodnik. So what you essentially have here is an electronic uh, device in the middle of the ball. These spikes that are coming out of it are essentially to hold the electronic device in the center of the ball, okay? And this was the original system that was evaluated by, um, by FIFA in 2005 at the Under-17 World Cup, okay? It's not video-based, uh, so it should work. One of the issues you would say with video-based is what happens if it's really crowded in the goal mount? You wanna have bodies all over the place. You could have issues with the video systems reliably able to pick out the ball where it is, okay? You won't have it with this because it's not video-based. Of course, one of the biggest drawbacks, and it's just a sign of the time, it's not video-based, okay? Which means no fancy uh, video replays with enhanced graphics for Sky TV, okay? Now, a more practical issue, potentially, is putting something in the ball. Does it change the dynamics? Does it, feel the change? Uh, does it affect the feel of the ball? Now, um, how does it work? So, again, quick bit of science. These two... Uh, Guys, a uh, guy called B.O. and Savar, uh, obviously from a hell of a long time ago, they are guys who looked at uh, magnet magnetism and electricity. And they identified what's called the B.O.-Savar law. And what this means is that when you've got an electric current flowing in a straight wire, you get a magnetic field created around the wire. Okay? That's the B.O.-Savar law. And we have an equation for it that basically says that the strength of that magnetic field is given by this equation down here. And the important parameter here is R. R is the distance from the wire that you are. If you measure the field at a small distance or if you measure it at a large distance, there's a difference in the field. Okay? So how does this Kairos system work? Um, basically, you have two um, cables. This is a bit of a simplification, but you have two cables laid under the turf. Okay? And each one has a current flowing through it. Okay? And I've denoted them here as a red one and as a green one. Okay? The, um, those two cables will have electric current flowing in it. As a result, they'll produce a magnetic field. And the magnetic field will look something like, the red one will look something like this, and the green one will look something like this. Now, quite unexpected, or quite expectedly, the position at which the red one is the maximum is when you're directly over the red wire. The position uh, at which the green one is maximum is when you're over the green wire. But the key point is here, where if you're at this position, if you're anywhere along that black line, you're actually going to measure both of the two uh, fields will have the same, exactly the same strength. So this is what's going to be used, and this is what's used by the, uh, by the Kairos solution. Okay? It essentially, the electronics that's in the middle of the ball measures the magnetic field. And if it measures the red guy as being bigger, it's uh, in the uh, pitch area. If it measures the green one, it's behind the scoring point. So it's looking for that transition from the red one being bigger to the green one being bigger, and if it detects that, or if it detects the two of them equal, officially, it's a goal. Okay, that's the basis of the thing. So here we have a, a little simulation of the thing going on, and um, as we said, when it hits the scoring point, which is, uh, as I said before, when the ball center is about 11 uh, centimeters behind the goal line, we have our goal, okay, and then it continues on. Okay, so, um, I have a nice video here. Hopefully, I can uh, pull it up. Okay, actually, I won't pull it up because the last video crashed. Let me just continue on. Um, essentially, uh, the system works pretty well, okay, in terms of uh, its accuracy. Okay, the issue I would see with it is uh, in terms of uh, is it as accurate, we'll say, as the Hawkeye. Um, 
So they're the three sort of most interesting solutions. Let me just talk about some of the others. The tag air solution, okay, tag air, damn expensive watches is the first thing people think about, okay? You go up to Hartman's uptown, you'll see them, you're not going to pay, uh, get a watch for anything less than a couple of grand probably. What's less well known is they are very, very widely used in uh, Formula One and motor racing for timing. Okay? And when you're timing in Formula One, essentially what you're trying to do is very accurately determine when does the vehicle pass over the start-finish line. And that's done by having a little electronic system called a transponder, these guys here, on the car, and having an antenna, a very localised antenna on the start-finish line. And the antenna determines when the transponder passes over the line. Okay? Very, very accurately in terms of space. It's not kind of a metre either side is very, very accurate in terms of knowing when the transponder has passed over it. And it can detect it, as you can imagine. It's not that the transponder is right at ground level. It can detect when the transponder is up to a certain height. So again, the Tag Air solution is more than likely based on an involved solution because in 2008, Tag Air worked with a Slovakian company to develop a smart puck for goal detection in ice hockey, where they basically put one of their transponders into the middle of the puck. Okay? Um, for the goal line, it's just a simple expansion of that concept. Put the transponder in the middle of the ball, put a number of localised loop antenna around uh, the, uh, the goal <coughs> at the 11 centimetre back behind the goal line. Okay? So the solution is pretty straightforward extension of what they already have successfully demonstrated and has been used in professional ice hockey for detecting goals in ice hockey. Uh, the others, Swiss timing. Swiss timing is most uh, well known for these kind of things, photo finish cameras. Okay? They operate at very, very high speed, so it's likely that their solution, again, is somewhat similar to Goalminder, where they have a high speed camera uh, monitoring the, the plane uh, at which uh, scoring happens, the 11 centimetre back from the goal line plane. Little else is known about that solution. Okay. The others are interesting. Um, two of the others, the Sports Vision Aura. These guys are companies that are broadcast enhancement companies, US companies. Okay. These are the guys that draw the yellow offside line on the TV and all the other fancy graphics that Sky Sports and their American equivalents do. Okay. Everything you can imagine you've ever seen in terms of artificial enhanced graphics for sporting, these guys are involved in it. Okay. One of their most interesting one is this, what they call Pitch FX where it's used in baseball, where basically they can track the trajectory of the baseball as it's moving <coughs> through the images. Now, doing that tracking itself is not that, uh, uh, not that impressive because all you have to do is track a ball. What's more impressive is this guy here, which is whether the ball went through the, the strike area in baseball. There's a certain region here the ball has to travel through. Okay? So in order to do that, you have to track the ball in three dimensions. So they effectively have a similar solution to Hawkeye, where they have a number of cameras looking at the scene, they identify the ball in each of them, they know where the cameras are, and hence they can track the ball in three dimensions. Okay? So the same with um, ORAD. ORAD is also a broadcast te enhancement technology company, and it's likely their solution is somewhat similar, looking at broadcast images and tracking the ball in it, working out where the ball is in three dimensions from that. Okay, so that's uh, kind of a quick overview of FIFA and where they're at. Um, in terms of what FIFA are doing, phase one... Um, has been just completed, and to progress to phase two, you have to pass a number of criteria uh, tests. Um, and they're actually carrying out these tests. Here's the, the, what they call unrestricted shot test, where this is actually a ca cannon, a ball cannon, and it's firing the balls as a goal. And you have to operate at 100% accuracy on that test. Uh, then you've got the rebound test, where they have this impact board. They fire the ball at it, again, out of the cannon. They position this board at different distances back from the goal line to determine uh, at settings where it is a goal and isn't a goal. And again, you have to be accurate, I think, to 90% accuracy on this test. Okay? Uh, then we have a similar uh, impact board test, but this time you have simulated players, okay, who are blocking the view and making it more difficult. And again, you have to operate at 90% accuracy on that. And you have this thing called a sledge test, where basically you've got this uh, contraption here, you roll the ball down it, and it's really there to see how... Uh, capable your system is at localising the position of the ball. So those tests were being carried out by a Swiss uh, independent Swiss, Swiss uh, testing company called EMP, or uh, institute called EMPA, and in order to progress to phase two, you have to pass uh, those tests. Phase two will be carried out um, between March and June. Only those who have passed phase one will do it, and it's a more difficult set of tests, okay, looking at system reliability, real-world tests involving players, games, floodlights, weather conditions, different types of playing surfaces, artificial, real, mud, grass, um, 
different speeds of shots with artificial tests, all these kind of things. And as I said before, the results are going to be reviewed in July by this IFAB who have the final say on whether or not they will look at one of these technologies and bring it forward. As I said, the Premiership have already indicated they'd like to have it for next season, but they've kind of admitted now that is unlikely to happen. So, is goal line technology all good news? Okay, it sounds like a great thing. A couple of things you have to bear in mind. Very, very high cost of deployment. Figures about half a million per site are being quoted. Um, no matter how good it is, it's not perfect. Okay, it's kind of a point missed by the general public. All systems will have a systemic error. No matter how good it is, there will be some error. You cannot, op it will not operate uh, with accuracy in terms of being able to locate the ball. It'll be plus or minus a couple of centimeters or a couple of millimeters, okay? And the question is, will it, how more likely is it that the system will make a mistake compared to how often officials make a, a mistake, okay? That's gonna be the real test of the system. And how does FIFA deal with the scenario, which will eventually happen where it makes the wrong decision? Okay? Eventually, a goal will be awarded when some high-speed television cameras will show it shouldn't have been, or vice versa. Okay? And it's about as educating the general public that the system is never going to be perfect. Okay? One of the other issues is universality. Okay? Having this means the rules of the games have now fundamentally changed, whether it's GA or whether it's soccer. It means that in one place, you're going to have goal line technology. You're never going to have it in Pierce Stadium. You're never going to have it in junior soccer in Galway. Okay? So, in one case, you're having it, in another case, you're not. In one case, the ref has a say on everything. In another case, he doesn't. Okay? And what happens in, co in competitions where you have a mixture of uh, levels, like the FA Cup? Okay? The FA Cup starts off with village teams, goes all the way up to the Premiership. What happens if Man United gets drawn against Crawley Town and it's played in United? Is goal line technology going to be used then? What happens if it was played in Crawley Town? It's not going to be there because it's half a million to get it in. They're not going to put it in. I suppose the last one, you know, what are the boys going to talk about? What is the boys on uh, Eamon in particular going to have to talk about if, uh, if we've got this? Well, lots of other things. So there's stuff that will never be dealt with by automated systems. Offside, square balls in Gaelic, etc., etc. All right, so that's kind of all I want to say about goal line technology. The remaining kind of 10 minutes, I want to talk a little bit about the players and how technology has been used in terms of players. Okay? Um, some of you might be familiar that in recent years there's been a lot of deployment of uh, technology, uh, even in the GAA at county level and below county level, you're beginning to see it now, uh, in the use of uh, technology for monitoring players while they're training, while they're active, trying to determine are players performing at their optimal level. Are they, for example, during a game adhering to tactical instructions, we'll say it's a zone mark or man mark or whatever it might be. Are they maintaining their fitness level? Are they recuperating? Are they injured? Are they carrying an injury? What is it? Now, in the past, kind of video analysis has been used at the elite level here, where you'd have either automated systems or semi-automated systems that would take the video feed from a game, would kind of track players, how much they've run, how distance they've run. We've all seen the stats on the Champions League game for this kind of stuff. But that type of video analysis is limited because, you know, you need video, you need the software. Again, it's a cost-based solution. So, what we're beginning to see is the use of GPS technology, okay? I have one of these devices here, just to give you an idea of the size of them, same as the one that's there. They're pretty small devices, okay? You begin to see these being used in uh, GEA, uh, particularly in uh, Australian football, where they've been used very, very widely for the last number of years, okay? And they're far more flexible. You can use them anywhere, okay? You don't need them in the, you don't need to be in a stadium. You can literally use them anywhere, okay? They're worn by the players, um, in a harness, here's uh, one of the Irish Roy players, Jerry, what's his name, uh, Flannery, uh, wearing it. It's been inserted in this uh, harness. Uh, here's a back end view of it. That's literally where it's held. So, in terms of most sports, that's an Australian football one, which obviously is a far more contact oriented one. A rugby um, is contact oriented as well. And there's been no reported injuries when these have been worn, and they have been worn in real games, not just in, in training games. They were used very widely in AFL throughout the season for monitoring during games. So they are very safe. Um, they're very high speed in terms of logging GPS and very accurate, very highly accurate in terms of localizing where you are in, in, in GPS coordinates. And they measure, take measurements about five, 10 or 15 times a second, which is way higher than what you'll see in your average mobile phone, okay? So you can do, because it's so accurate in time and in space, you can do interesting things when it comes to players. Okay, you're able to actually look at the speed of a player and detect when they break into a sprint or when are they running at different speed ranges, how much, are, how much time did they spend idling around the pitch 
or how much time did they spend sprinting. Okay, so it's a very, very useful tool. There's lots of interesting uh, software capabilities. The data is logged during the game onto this device most commonly. At the end of the game then, you can take the device and you upload the data to it and you have special software, cap software pieces of software on your PC. It allows you to do this kind of stuff. I've, I've got a couple of plots here. Here's uh, one of the guys here, Kevin, who's in fine gear. He wore this. He's uh, one of the Sigerson panel team. Half forward, team playing this way. This was his trace during the first half. Okay, we can see here the color coding here is when he was running at different speed ranges. Okay, so it looks like a jumble of information. That's kind of the next step here. How do you interpret all this information? But you can do other types of analysis on it. You can look at, well, when did he sprint? Okay, there's a sprint. You must have been doing a bit of laziness there, Kevin. No, you weren't doing a lot of, <laughs> lot of sprinting. Okay. Okay, it, maybe if we told him at a particular time to maybe, looks like maybe he was told to push forward a bit more here. Okay, we, we're localizing the time in the second half, you know, seeing where, where was he actually, was he doing the job he was supposed to do? If we tell someone to push forward, did he actually push forward into a space? Okay, so again, very, very, very useful in analyzing um, uh, the um, tactical aspect of the game. And here we have kind of tabular information about some of the sprints, you know, when did he sprint during the game? What kind of speeds was he running at? How long did he maintain that for? Um, what was his max speed? What was his average speed? All this kind of stuff. Okay, and we can get summaries as well. Here's a summary for the whole game. Here's his two halves, the inner circle, the outer circle. We can see that uh, the inner circle, I think, is the uh, first half. We can see that, you know, he was kind of, the higher speeds are about the same for the two halves, lower speed, a slight differential between them, but quite similar. So it kind of gives you an idea, well, probably the guy is pretty fit. He, he didn't kind of wear out during the game. Okay, what else? Apart from GPS, can these systems do? Well, they can monitor your heart rate. Uh, you can wear a little monitor for your heart rate. <coughs> they can measure your force, the forces you feel, okay, when you're tackled. Here's an event where it was a tackle on a player. These are three measurements of force. There's a, a device inside this called an accelerometer, which actually measures physical force, okay? So as, the device, as this device has been worn in a fixed position on your back, this, device, this accelerometer chip inside the thing can actually measure force going this way, going that way, and going this way. So it can tell you when this guy took a hit. When did he take a big hit? How many did he take? Okay, so that's particularly useful in uh, very heavy contact games. Maybe, I suppose GA probably, there isn't supposed to be an awful lot of very heavy contact, but in the likes of Robbie AFL, it's probably more substantial. So again, you can monitor, you know, has this player taken an awful lot of hits during the game? Um, you know, maybe there's likelihood they're gonna get injured. Probably the most useful aspect of it is you can actually get it, if you, as long as you pay for it, you can actually get a real-time feed from the devices. Here's a, 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 a photo taken in one of the Irish rugby training sessions. This is actually a, a radio receiver that's uh, capable of picking up in real-time all this information from uh, the players who are wearing them. Okay? And it means the data can be fed to the coaches in real time. <coughs> they can see whether someone is tiring. They could see, as I said, whether they've taken a big hit Okay. Now, what they do with the data is the question. That's a, a lot of what it, the current research is. These are great systems, but how do you interpret all this data that is coming in? Okay. One of the other problems, of course, is uh, where's the ball? Okay. Um, we can track players um, in terms of interpreting, are they doing their job? Well, you need both teams to be wearing the devices. And then where is the ball? The ball obviously can't be tracked. So um, is there any solutions for this? And there is. There's one company that actually has a ball tracking solution. Uh, it's a semi-ball tracking solution. Uh, it basically operates by putting a little uh, tag, an electronic tag, inside the ball. Um, and it's uh, more than likely made out of uh, a plastic type uh, material. And it is basically allows this device, this type of device, to actually detect when is the ball in the player's possession. Okay, can't detect it when the ball is flying between people, but of course, if it's in my possession now and it's in Miles's possession in three seconds' time, I've passed to him. So it can do stuff like figuring out, well, when did I carry the ball? When did I pass the ball? And if you're interested in seeing, well, did Link Martin just hog the ball every time he got it, or did he actually do what he's supposed to do by laying it off to various players? This would allow you to do that sort of thing. Okay, what about the future? Last couple of slides. What about the future in terms of sensing? Okay. So current technology, we can measure GPS, we can measure heart rate, we can measure temperature, we can measure respiration. GA ran trials uh, in the last year or two where the refs and the linesmen wore these special vests developed by DCU and UCD that monitored all these things. Okay? 
Um, what about the future? What else would you like to monitor apart from those things? Well, one thing you would like to monitor is hydration levels during a game. Is someone beginning to get dehydrated? Uh, or more generally, look at the chemical makeup, okay? And the easiest way to do that would be to look at their sweat, okay? So there's actually sensors, sweat sensors being developed. And to give you an idea of the scale of these devices here, this is a photograph. This little, what looks like a line between these two things, is 200 microns. That's uh, 0.2 of a millimeter in, in width, okay? That's the width of that thing. So these devices are tiny devices, okay? They are uh, what we call microfluidic devices. They are devices that are able to soak up sweat, if they're in contact with the skin, soak up sweat and channel it up through this uh, little channel here by itself. Okay? And a little chemical reaction goes on while it's going through the channel that uh, measures the pH, the chemical make a very basic measure of chemistry in the sweat. Okay? If we then put a little bit of electronics either side of it, we can actually measure the color of that. You can see that that color is a little bit yellow this one is much darker because the color reflects the pH of the sweat. So by putting a little electronics where you shine a light through this device and it measures the color, you could in theory have a device that could measure the pH of your sweat. Okay, that's still at development stage up in DCU, but with a view to deploying it as part of an integrated sports vest, sensor vest that a player could wear so that you could further enhance um, their um, sensing capabilities. Okay, looking even further down the line, if you wanted to look at what's going on under the, the skin, okay, if you look under the skin and maybe measure some of the body, the fluids in the body, you could get maybe a better idea about the biochemistry of what's going on. But not an easy thing to do, obviously. How do you go under the skin? Okay, obviously you have to go through the skin to go under it. There are these devices here that are being developed in Tyndall, which is an institute down in Cork. Um, let me just get a feed here of this video camera. I have a few of them. Okay. Um, these are them here. These are just square little things. They, the patterns you see on them are spikes. Okay, they're about 250 microns in height, about a quarter of a millimeter. Those, those particular spikes. Um, the thing about them being that height is that they will go through the outer layer of the skin, which is dead skin. Okay, but they don't go deep enough to hit the nerves, so there's no pain. You don't feel pain. Now these things can be. Um, Fabricated. They are fabricated. The only way you can fabricate these things accurately is to use exactly the same technology that's used to build microchips, okay? Using very, very expensive uh, hardware that the likes of Intel uh, have up in uh, up in uh, up in <coughs> Leeds that to actually build their microprocessors. Same type of machines are used to build these. They're so highly accurate. And what they can do is they can put a little hole in each of these, the tip of each of these guys, and build a little device at the back of the electrode on the other side of the electrode that can suck up fluid out through the tip, okay? And have a little chamber at the back that allows a chemical reaction to go on uh, that could be used to measure things like maybe the, uh, the blood chemistry, if you could get some small amount of blood into it. To give you an idea of the scale, this blue thing is actually the tip of an ordinary syringe, okay? Uh, so they're minute, absolutely minute, okay? So maybe, you will see that type of technology down the line in five or ten years being used to sense uh, athletes' biochemistry. Okay, last couple of slides, the mental game. That's the physical. What about the player's mental state? Okay, you hear a lot of stuff about being in the zone, but from an engineering or scientific perspective, what does in the zone mean? Can you measure it? Okay, um, can you use technology to measure it? And this is definitely sort of something maybe that's five, five to ten years away. There are lots of snake oil merchants out there that kind of sell this technology. It's very low scientific merit. Okay, it may look good technically, it may look great on the ad, but the science behind it has to be validated at very, very early stage of validation. Okay, there are techniques called biofeedback where you wear devices which measure the, um, some of your body signals like your heart rate or the electrical resistance of your skin and they are supposed to vary in a certain way when you are getting focused. Okay, and if you're not focused, they should have different values. And the idea of these uh, equipment is that you train yourself to get into a focused state. Okay? But as I said, it's a little bit of snake oil. How can measuring these body uh, measurements tell you about your mental state? How about using something to do with uh, your brain rather than the rest of your body? Can you measure your brain and can it be used in a sporting context, any measurement of your brain? Okay? 
Uh, this is where EEG comes in. EEG is a technique. Uh, here's an example of an EEG being actually taken. It's a technique that's used in the laboratory, a lot of it in, in medical and in research to understand how the brain works and to make certain medical diagnosis related, we'll say, to things like epilepsy. Um, uh, essentially, you sit in, you get wired up, you put on a, a very uncomfortable cap, you have all these electrodes attached to your head. They are just, uh, they're not painful, they're just electrodes that are clipped into the cap. Uh, the most uncomfortable thing is that for every electrode, they have to put in this little conductive gel. So you've got all this conductive gel in your hair and you have to wash it out at the end of it all. But it allows you to read the electrical signals coming that are on your scalp, which are coming from different parts of your brain. Okay? And the more electrodes you have, the more parts of the brain you can look at. You can see, are they active? Okay, how are they active? When are they active when you're doing some task? Okay, there could be up to 128 electrodes there. Anything from about 64 to 128 is the most common. Now, how are they being used in sports? Well, here we can see how, what a portable EEG looks like. Okay? It looks a bit like a guy who's gone off hiking in the country. <coughs> He's wearing a portable EEG system here on his back. He's a golfer. He's got a skull cap on with the electrodes in there. And here we have the uh, wire hanging off to the computer system where the data has been stored. Okay? You can see this is so far away from being deployed. Okay? This is lab. This is uh, research-based stuff. But essentially, the second-hand graph, you can measure things like, and studies, academic studies have been done, measuring the, uh, how different parts of the brain are reacting as this guy is uh, carrying out a putt. Okay? You would look at things like the pre-shot uh, part of the putt, the post-shot part of it, were certain parts of his brain active, what parts of the brain were active, when were they active in terms of the shot, uh, in terms of being active, you know, um, what do we mean by being active? You know, what are we actually measuring? And then is there a correlation between some of these measures and how many putts the guy got? That's what, in terms of sports, is the, is the most important thing. So you can see, you certainly couldn't expect anything like that to be worn, but what you could see is something like this evolving. This is the latest kind of technology for EEG. Okay? This is stuff that's been used for consumer applications, where you literally put it on like this. It measures... These are the white things you see here are the electrodes. They measure your brain activity on certain locations. It's not as dense in terms of the number of electrodes as you will see in the lab-based systems, but it's a starting point, okay? This type of system, you could see it evolving, perhaps being built into things like helmets in American football, uh, certainly into things like maybe golf visors and stuff like that, to carry out studies, okay? Um, you know, you could even see it, if you remember back, I think it was 2009, United, Man United were in the Carling Cup uh, against Tottenham, penalty shootout, uh, <coughs> Eric Steele, the United goalkeeping coach, brought an iPad out to uh, Ben Foster for the penalty kicks to show him what was the typical kicks uh, of the Arsenal or the Spurs team. Okay, you can imagine a scenario where a device like this might be brought out to help the selection of the penalty takers, to see who was now the most focused player, rather than the usual thing, which is who doesn't want to take the penalty, and the guys who take them are the guys who are left. Okay, absolute kind of gazing five years down the line. Now, as I said, there has been some research done, particularly in precision sports, uh, things like golf, archery, pistol shooting, looking at real scientific work, looking at EEG, what parts of the brain are involved in the whole sporting activity, in the precision activity, what is a good measure of likely success. Okay? So this is certainly an area which is quite interesting. We're, we're working on this type of area here in NUI Galway. And you know, let's see how it evolves. There are lots of questions to ask. Okay? You certainly can't say you measure this and you'll definitely be able to say this guy is going to take your penalty and score. Okay? We have no idea at this stage what we need to look at or when we need to look at it. Okay, so that's the end of the talk. I just want to particularly want to thank Shane and Miles for helping setting up uh, everything, particularly the work Shane has put in on this demo. I want to also thank Pat Daly, GA, for sharing the information on Hawkeye and Gemma Voice in Hawkeye for sharing some other information with me. And I want to thank you all for listening. Uh, as you can see, that's the real reason Frank Lampard didn't score. I'm sure you've all seen that one before. And if anyone has any questions, throw them at me. Hopefully I can answer. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, well, a very interesting question because this is something we actually looked at coming back to our project when we were looking at hurling. Um, as I said, there was another part of that project which was the mechanical engineering side, and 
they actually did uh, high-speed camera studies of what happened to a, a slitter. And you're absolutely right. When the slitter was struck, the thing does deform massively in terms of a slitter. Okay, that was actually one of the reasons you couldn't kind of use an in-ball technology for slitters because the compressive forces would be they destroy anything you put in a slitter. Football is slightly different because um, you know you have this cushioned effect by the air inside the ball. And um, most of these systems, uh, as I said, if you take the Kairos one, the thing inside the ball, you have those struts that keep the electronic. It's where the centre of the ball is. It's the key thing. They keep that uh, electronic circuit in the middle of the ball. So that's how it develops. The, the likes of Hawkeye do actually put in place in part of their software uh, mathematical models that allow the ball to get deformed so they can predict what the deformation is likely. And uh, the system, when it comes to actually finding the ball in the image, it will be capable of finding any kind of reasonably expected deformation. You're never going to see the ball squished up like that. It'll just deform ever so slightly. So they are capable of doing it in one way or another uh, within reason. Okay. Are there any safeguards in place for if it's raining and distorts the image on the lens, obviously? Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting one. Again, that's what FIFA are going to look at in this phase, too, is how these systems do perform, um, you know, in, in all weather, in all weather, weather conditions. Um, you know, Hawkeye uh, and uh, all the other camera-based systems, uh, they're probably going to have the likes of kind of a, a rain shield over the camera, or the camera will be in some sort of a housing that has a rain shield. But... There are six cameras, that's a redundancy of four. So the likelihood is if there's a problem with one, that's why the engineer is there on site all the time to probably deal with that type of problems. He can give a guy a shout on the radio, go over and clean off the lens. You know, you've seen it in Formula One anyway. They have solutions in Formula One where they're li they can rip off a covering automatically on the lens for the Formula One cars if it gets covered in grit. So there are solutions out there for dealing with those lens problems. Do you know if anybody is looking at in-ball GPS for goal line sensing? Uh, not that I'm aware of. I'm not sure if the accuracy would be sufficient, to be honest. Um, uh, also, you know, it would be quite complex to get that level of circuitry down to a small enough solution, you know, and still to maintain the dynamics, but that would be just a guess, but I'm not aware of it now, to be honest. Okay, listen, thank you all very much. I hope you got something out of the talk. Thank you.